Yes, so welcome everyone uh, and good morning. It's, this is CodeNARC Revisited Part 2. Uh, so this is not the introduction to CodeNARC. This is a uh, follow-up to some stuff I've done, I, or a talk I did last year. The best way to uh, follow what's going on with me is on Twitter. I'm Code Generator. It's, uh, Interesting pun. Anyway, uh, so the slides for this should have gone out a few minutes ago. Uh, they're also posted on speaker deck. If you uh, do some searching, you should be able to find it. So as a little bit of background about me, uh, I have moved around a bit. You may be able to tell from my accent that I'm originally an American. I have uh, worked in the US uh, in a bunch of different places. I started using Groovy in 2013 and I uh, kind of moved around a bit in Minneapolis in the US. Uh, after doing that for a few years, I kind of decided that I wanted to take a deeper look at the way that Groovy works uh, kind of under the hood. So I submitted a research proposal to uh, the Technical University of Denmark, which is not to this university, but uh, about 20 kilometers north of here. Uh, and it's the, the engineering school. So I, of course, was accepted. And I've been spending the last uh, nine and a half, roughly, months uh, taking some classes and learning about uh, compilers and program analysis and some theory that uh, I can apply back to some things like CodeNARC and the Groovy compiler. Uh, also done lots of other things. You may know me uh, as the co-founder of the organization Great Ladies, uh, which supports women in, the, in getting more women into the Groovy community. We have a lot of different initiatives. If you want to check out our website, it's greatladies.org. Okay. The other announcement, so this is actually my last last week uh, officially doing this, this stuff in Denmark. I will start at a new job on Monday. So I'm moving to Berlin to go work for this startup uh, called Zenjob, and uh, I'll, I'll still actually, you'll hear in the, the end that I'm going to continue doing some of this stuff uh, in my free time, but it won't be my primary focus anymore. Okay, so that is a fair bit about me uh, for people who, who aren't already familiar. I would also kind of like to know a little bit about you uh, since this is, like I said, definitely not the intro talk. So who is familiar and who has used CodeNARC uh, or is currently using CodeNARC in their stuff? Okay, um, and so who is not just I uh, used it, but who has actually looked at the source code and maybe even written a rule or fixed a bug? Okay, a few. Uh, and yeah, hopefully you have contributed back to the CodeNARC project if you are familiar with it. Um, if you haven't used CodeNARC before, uh, or if you have, but uh, maybe it's been a while. Uh, who is familiar with kind of program analysis, compiler theory? Are you familiar with words like elementary block, uh, binary expressions, and how the, the trees are organized? I'll spend some time on that. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah. So yeah, so if this was uh, not what you were expecting, uh, I, I won't be offended if you get up and leave. Just please do so quietly. Uh, and yeah, there's some other good talks at this time as well. So I'll kind of do a little bit of a recap of part one, uh, just to, to go over the common themes and talk about some things that have happened uh, in the last year. I'll walk through how I created a custom rule for CodeNARC that was eventually contributed back. And um, that'll probably finish up the part on CodeNARC itself. Uh, and then, as time permits, move into the uh, bytecode analysis and optimization project that I ended up kind of pivoting to after I found some limitations with CodeNARC. OK. So if you want to go back later uh, and watch it, it, there's a link to last year's uh, part one video. And uh, yeah, so it's from this one, 
there's also, uh, I also gave that talk last year at GreatConf US, but that video is not released. So for the few hands uh, that, or people who didn't raise their hands and weren't familiar with CodeNARC. So CodeNARC is the static analysis tool for Groovy. Uh, it is not just about uh, checking, checking styles or uh, formatting or linting or anything like that. It's much more complex and it, it lets you do some other things to enforce uh, best practices in other ways. Uh, so yeah, so it's very similar if you're coming from the Java space to things like PMD and check style, but specifically for your Groovy code. There's some important reasons why you should be using CodeNARC, and that's kind of been the theme of this conference. If you were at the keynote yesterday, uh, you heard about uh, making your code more concise and simple, and CodeNARC can help with that, particularly for people that are transitioning from Java into the Groovy space. You uh, get a lot of benefits uh, from, from applying these rules. Uh, and not just, not just uh, formatting, but also with, uh, with bugs. There are some terms that are going to come up uh, over and over again. Uh, so the first one is, what is a rule? So rules are uh, particular analyses and particular things that we want to target and either raise warnings or suggest alternatives to. Uh, and then all of the little rules fall into this uh, concept of a rule set. And so, for example, formatting is a rule set that contains different rules like spaces, making sure you have a space after a switch statement, or uh, catching if you have trailing white space at the end of a line, uh, and that uh, things can be configurable too, like how you want your braces around uh, certain things. But it's, it's not just formatting. So there are some other sections that I didn't cover uh, very well in part one. And uh, that is the idea that uh, it, it, when you have access to the things that you do in, in CodeNARC, you can detect uh, things like busy weights and bad practices and concurrency. Uh, there are some rules that apply to unsafe database connection management and detecting those in your source code. There are some things around security, finding places where maybe you should have a final or a private field instead. And there are some just better design things as well, uh, particularly if you have the ability to uh, enable the complexity metrics. Okay. Then there are uh, two main ways that you're probably using CodeNARC. Uh, for the ones that have it. And the most common one uh, within the space is probably gonna be uh, the Gradle plugin. So the Gradle plugin uh, is uh, really easy to set up. I went through kind of the steps of that in the last one. Then there is also a Grails plugin for CodeNARC as well. The difference, the major difference being that you use the Grails plugin for everything 2.0 uh, and Less and then if you're using Grails three, you can now use the Gradle plugin. Uh, if you want to learn more about how to do that in Grails, uh, I hear that there is a new Grails guide coming out on Monday that will go into a lot more detail on uh, setting that up and how you can include it in your Grails project and even some things that are going to go beyond uh, what I've done. Okay, so that was a recap of. Uh, the things I've talked about just to make sure we're kind of on the same page. So the best way to take a look at what has happened since then is to look at the change log. So CodeNARC is actually pretty well organized for an uh, open source project. And the change log uh, goes over some things like the dates and what's included. So uh, I gave this talk and it included everything up and through last summer. It is a smaller project, so it doesn't have uh, releases that frequently. The most recent one after that was in October of last year. And most of that was around bug fixes. And yeah, so there, there's a long list of them there. If, uh, and this is actually a good time to point out as well that if you are uh, not using CodeNARC or maybe if you have some rules turned off because you were getting false positives, there are people fixing bugs, including myself. So if you see something you uh, want to change, uh, definitely submit an issue 
uh, and these things are, are getting fixed. Yeah, uh, and then at the bottom there were a couple of other changes just to the structure and how CodeNARC works. Then uh, during, let's see, so the, the next transition happened in March, and uh, this was actually uh, in the time when I had a little bit of a break from the university. So I was able to make my first official contribution uh, to the CodeNARC project that made it into this March release. It was just a really simple bug fix, um, and, but it, it definitely got the ball rolling uh, before I could spend some time working with CodeNARC more closely. Okay, so the uh, next part is what is, so what's coming next? So there, we're now at the release of uh, 0270, and uh, we've been doing some other things. So even uh, as of last night at the Hacker Garden, uh, I was really excited that we got, uh, or the team did most of the, the hard work. Uh, there's now two more pull requests that should get included in the next release. One that fixes a major issue that I was having with the no def rule. Uh, so as a little bit of background, there is an issue with no def that it was applying to the source code in general and catching it when I had stuff in comments. And now it's actually going to re-implement that rule correctly and use the proper AST uh, approach. There's also another uh, new feature that should come out of that, and that is that uh, uh, Andre, who I don't think is uh, here right now, but uh, did some work to add suppress warnings at the level of the individual field. So you can suppress warnings at the level of the class and at the level of methods, but this will expand it even further. So if you have things like variable names that are failing particular rules, you can uh, suppress warnings on an individual uh, field level. So both of those, of course, came from first-time contributors to the CodeNARC project, so anyone uh, can really help out and, uh, and do some of these things. Okay. There are some other things that have happened uh, since that last release, uh, and these, these are all me. <laughs> um, so I, I fixed some other bugs that were uh, bothering me and some uh, issues that other people had raised uh, and some things to make it easier to contribute back. I fixed some problems with the templates and such. Uh, the, the big thing that I did in uh, this release, though, is I actually created my first rule from scratch and contributed that. So I haven't gone that approach yet. It's not that hard to do, uh, and so I'll walk through some of the steps. There is actually a script to get started, and this is kind of the output of it. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, hopefully that's a little bit easier to read from the, the top now. So if you run uh, the script that's at the... so. Of course, you have to download the source code for CodeNARC if you're working in developer mode, but it's really just a script that sits at the, the root level of the project. And if you run that create rule task, uh, it uh, generates a bunch of files for you. So uh, it starts with your name, the rule that you want to create uh, in the categories. From part one, I went over some of what uh, the categories are, but the documentation on SourceForge is actually really good too. So you find kind of what type of rule you want to create. Uh, I think for this one I just did like test example rule, uh, and then it has to do with simplifying our code, so we're going to remove something that's unnecessary. At the bottom, you see all of the files that are created. So you get uh, the, the rule itself, which is going to be automatically hooked in, uh, in the right places. You get some sample tests and uh, the documentation as well. It's going to uh, enforce that. OK. So this is what it looks like when you first get started with creating a new rule. And it's not, it doesn't seem like it's much, it's uh, just a basic uh, class, but it's extending a, a larger framework that gives you a lot of different helper functions that you can use. And the uh, kind of interesting things from 
this perspective. So you, you of course, have the, the name that gets used in a bunch of different things like the reports, and the priority, uh, which was one, two, or three, so one being the most severe things, uh, and three being more like formatting or just suggestions, things you don't necessarily have to uh, do. You also get, uh, it, for separation of concerns, you get this uh, AST visitor uh, that you can use to, to traverse it. If you're doing something that's more on the source code level, like there are some rules about like the trailing white space one or about um, like detecting extra new lines, then you can, instead of traversing the entire AST, you can uh, go into some helper functions that just analyze the source code line by line. Okay. You also get uh, an example test that uh, is a really good pattern to follow. So if you, you do contribute back, you should at least come up with a, a case where uh, you're getting a single or yeah, first test that it, w it works normally, that you have no violations on something that you would expect, that uh, you get one violation <laughs> if like when you first come across it and then the next part kind of varies based on the rule so depending on what type of analysis you're doing uh you may want to stop after you find the first occurrence of uh a rule of a violation other times you may want to be able to support multiple violations say if um what was the one oh uh, when we were doing the node f1 last night uh that you can have uh, the def multiple times, and you want to say, okay, on line 10 and on line 12, uh, that's where your problems are. Uh, and, and it can get a little bit tricky with the way that uh, this visitor pattern works, that um, you want to make sure that you handle those correctly and you're managing the line numbers and things like that. So more specifically, once I got into uh, doing this could be switch rule, uh, I applied or took those templates and, and just kind of made it work. So if you are familiar with, uh, well, probably aren't because it's not released yet, they could be switch rule. It uh, relies heavily on the way that the Groovy switch or the switch works in Groovy. And uh, so I actually, this is directly from uh, Mr. Hockey's blog. And it's by far the best example of this that I, I found. Um, so you should definitely go in and read the whole thing. But uh, the, the interesting part is about how switches actually work in Groovy, that you can, not, you can match on a lot of different things. So you can match on regexes, you can match on the type the, by class, you can match over an entire range of things and uh, behave differently. So this can really consolidate some very large, complex branching structures where you have a whole bunch of if, if this, if that. Uh, and you're testing, especially if you're testing lots of uh, really complex uh, examples. Anyway, uh, so the idea here was to uh, suggest use switching to a switch instead of having uh, a bunch of ifs and branching. So the beginning part looks very similar. Uh, it, this is mostly just a setup for the reports. I made it a priority three because this may not be something that you want, uh, or it, it may have some false positives in the beginning until it gets hammered out. Um, yeah. And then it gets uh, a little bit more complex. Most of this is specific to the rules and trying to figure out scenarios where uh, if one side is equal to the other. Um, but the things that I really wanted to touch on or focus here were uh, the ways that the way that this works. So you uh, every time it visits any type of if statement, uh, and it, the way that the tree works is, is how this works. But anyway, um, you can kind of evaluate and go into the level of, of an if statement. And this would be true of any other type of block as well. And uh, you can compare the uh, expression types and, and go into to more detail. Um, 
you also want to restrict it on, on a few different things. I also enforced my, my own rule there. So that's an example that uh, you can take the, the type of block in CodeNARC and uh, so if it's of any of those types of things, it reduces it down to um, a, a much shorter statement. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's mostly specifics that you can, you can look at the source code and ask me if you have any specific questions. The other things that you need to do after you've written your rule, and of course your tests, which are not uh, included here, uh, are, is to actually make sure that uh, your documentation matches up. So the, the messages.properties file is uh, the example rule that's going to show up in the small report. So in the HTML report or in the XML report, uh, you get these kind of informative things about why this is a rule. And then also want to expand out on the actual documentation. So the things that are important here are the examples, particularly like with this switch statement, I made it so that if it's at least um, three branching conditions in a row, uh, and that was kind of arbitrary, so that's something that needed to be documented specifically. Okay. So this was uh, not exactly what I had uh, first proposed doing for uh, static analysis. I had originally wanted to do this uh, analysis based on, on finding loops, but there are some major limitations still to the way that CodeNARC works uh, and how, how much access you get to the, the AST. And the AST that's used in CodeNARC is a little bit different than the one that's used in the Groovy compiler. Um, Another, another kind of example that we found out a few months ago is that um, it's really difficult in CodeNARC to detect if something is a Spock test. So uh, I thought it would be pretty simple. Okay, yeah, I mean, anything that eventually extends specification should be a Spock test, right? But uh, what if, uh, uh, well, in most cases, you're not extending specification directly. You're several layers deep, and it's some, some super, super, super class. Uh, but the way that uh, you would have to traverse the tree to find how to get all the way back up to, is this eventually going to reach a specification, is not that easy of a task. Uh, and CodeNARC actually at, at one point stops tracking how many uh, parents deep it is. Uh, so there are some things that, uh, that need to be need to be fixed, and hopefully, uh, I can continue to to work on and, and find ways to to get around that. Okay, so that is kind of how I got to uh, the end of my uh, route trying to go through CodeNARC. Um, because it is, I, I was able to do a little bit more complex things, uh, but there's still a lot of work to do. And I hope that uh, all of you will help and contribute and uh, get past some of these things as well. So since I couldn't, uh, couldn't get as deep as I wanted to with CodeNARC, uh, I ended up going down to the level of the Groovy compiler. And I uh, created a, a project that kind of looks at the bytecode and does some different types of program analysis, uh, more so on the, on the bytecode level. If you, uh, let's see, so if you have any interest and I uh, want to take a look at it, there's a link there that goes to the final report. Um, Uh, it's a limitation for it. of links to other helpful things. The the interesting part within the Groovy compiler. So these are uh, three three main, uh, I'll call them strategies, for compiling Groovy code. Uh, and so the first one is uh, the, the legacy version. So this was in early versions of Groovy before they, there was Invoke dynamic support, which was added in Java 7. Uh, it, there was this really 
elegant, well, not necessarily elegant, but it worked. A way to, to compile Groovy code that then uh, later released, and now you can use that instead uh, of having to use this, this older style that has a lot more overhead. When you uh, compile the code to, to use that, examples in, in the project. Anyway, uh, and then the third one that you've probably heard about uh, is compile static. So compile static is uh, a much more restrictive uh, way to compile Groovy source code. You get uh, a lot of advantages in performance, if, but only if you're not doing some of the more complex and more dynamic things in Groovy. Uh, Otherwise, as from some of the examples, it, you can't, you just can't compile it using compile static. With that is that if we look at, so this is just a simple loop, uh, and into or when it gets compiled into bike. So the, at the level of, actually, I should probably do a little bit more of an overview. Uh, so in order to take a script like that into uh, or Groovy, uh, wraps it in script class, and then adds the main method, which runs, uh, runs whatever code you put in your, your small script. And so the way that this works in the legacy compiler, like you, you have some overhead involved in the call site caching for all of this stuff instead. But in that uh, it reduces a lot of that stuff. It doesn't. The invoke dynamic uh, operation. Smaller uh, set of bytecode, uh, and and all of this does the same thing. The uh, third option there was static compilation. So in uh, static compilation, the the instruction is slightly different, um, and this is this is all JVM stuff, uh, and it's similar to invoke dynamic in that way, but uh, differs in uh, some more, some other ways. So the, on the left is an example of how the hello world example works in the invoke dynamic case. Uh, it uh, just calls running hello world. But in the version on the right, which comes from static compilation, there's actually some extra overhead because it's doing all of those extra checks. So you have to uh, do some typecasting, and uh, it keeps track of some. To the end of this example on the right, you notice that uh, it's uh, adding things and then popping things off the stack. The fact that sometimes you need it and sometimes strange when we were going through and seeing all of the and uh, when you take this back to the concept that I originally proposed about uh, trying to optimize loops anything that we can do to reduce that code uh, should be helpful okay yeah so that was uh, we were identifying different places These examples show up all over the place of uh, places in particular. So in a load instruction, it means that uh, it's a value and uh, pushing it onto the stack and then immediately popping it. And it seems kind of strange, like why would you do these two things right after another? Uh, similarly, when you 
uh, do an assignment statement, it duplicates that value to put onto the stack in case you need it later, and then uh, actually stores the value. So it was kind of confusing to see, like, where, where is this pop coming from? Uh, and so it actually has to do with the way, th or the, the feature of Groovy, which I always thought default. So when you method or a um, script, it returns that last line. But in order to support that, there's a lot of so it, you don't get the context of knowing what's next. So every time you, uh, it goes through the statement, it saves that value in case it needs it later. Fine. So of course, uh, long The uh, or make it more efficient in that. Way. But I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> um, it's it's going to take a lot more time to look and dive into specific parts of the code. Uh, this is a really really big project at this point, and um, uh, it, that that's definitely a much more long term goal. But what I could do in the short term was just to pro or, uh, do some tests and create an analysis to see if this would actually matter. Um, like what, what, what would happen if we removed all of those extra instructions? Uh, so I created a, uh, a post pass optimization. So I, I took from the Groovy compiler from each of these scripts and applications. I pass that into the ASM reader. So uh, if you haven't worked with the Groovy compiler before, it uses the bytecode library ASM. So now uh, I, I'm just, I separated it out so it's not part of the, the project. Uh, put it into a reader, ran, ran some loops to try and find these things, remove the excess instructions, and then write it back out to, uh, to bytecode. So uh, yeah, and there, there's a link in the slides to that. Of course, found that the results of this were that um, there were no major perform differences in performance, uh, and that was explained very nicely. That uh, Java, the JVM, most JVMs that we actually run uh, Groovy code on are so optimized for this that it removes a lot of that when it does the class loading. However, having this extra uh, stuff removed can uh, help in other ways. And one of those is in that initial loading. So if you get smaller bytecode, which will result in smaller jars and smaller uh, distributions as well, uh, you can. actually run on the JVM. Okay. Then uh, I, yeah, so I finished that project, um, at least in my, my own little separate repository. And uh, what I would like to do next is to uh, submit that back to the, the Groovy compiler in general, and uh, at least as a temporary measure until we can find more long-term uh, ways to deal with that. Then, yeah, so I've uh, gone really deep. I should come back up a little bit. By, by reducing some of the, the overhead of, of loops, we can uh, kind of understand a little bit about what rules are the way they are, um, because it, there are about this specific example, that uh, when you do a for loop versus a collect versus an each, um, uh, looping that way. But uh, we can we can use tools like CodeNARC to, to try and catch it before before that, or we can optimize it at the level of the compiler. So that is uh, what I've done. Hopefully, uh, you will also uh, 
help out with some of this stuff as well. So if you, you found any of this interesting, uh, we can definitely chat on the Groovy Community Slack. Uh, if you haven't joined yet, it's at groovycommunity.com. And if you fill out the form, then we'll send you an invite to the channel. There's also we can talk about some of these things to what we can see problems related to, to last night, uh, we can get more pull requests into the project as well. Okay. Sure that um, but it send me an email or I'll be around. Um, does yes. When we are using IntelliJ, uh, can we uh, uh, is that, is that possible? Yeah, well, I mean, so there's different types of static analysis uh, that are built into IntelliJ as well. So they have their own uh, detections and checks that will kind of suggest some of these things, like you can uh, one, for example, is the uh, import. So if you have an import that's uh, not being used in your source code, then it will suggest or, or gray it out. Um, and that's not necessarily uh, CodeNARC, but uh, IntelliJ's own static analysis analyzing that source code. But there is, I think, at least there is a uh, CodeNARC plugin for uh, clips that came up in the last part was a CodeNARC uh, plugin for IntelliJ, but I usually run it separately as part of my build. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. so definitely read the guide that comes out on Monday. Um, and in, or how to do this in girls too. <laughs> yes. Right. Uh, so if you go, there are some things that are suggested. I I have a. Um, uh, but it's new rules because I have to, I try and test it myself first and see whether that's and sometimes it's something, a specific rule that you come up with. and uh, so like just on your project or on your team and uh, test it contributed uh, back to the project as well. The question was about um, ideas for, for new rules, and I would definitely look through the issues for that. I want to have one question, actually. Uh, we have uh, 10 minutes left. Or yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of uh, I've run CodeNARC against sample like brand new Grails apps. I'm sorry. Yeah, so it runs it against itself. Oh, yeah. So let's just okay. Yeah. And, okay, so I should, yeah, probably re repeat for everyone that um, so when you create a, a new Grails uh, application from scratch, and if you apply CodeNARC right away to it, uh, there are a few things that, that come out of the generated templates that 
improved things like the, uh, the, the mixing and matching between single quoted and double quoted strings. Um, lines difficult when you deal with a template and trying to get everything to line up right. Uh, the entire is run through CodeNARC? Yeah. I don't think that all, of, well, there's such a mix and match of Java in Groovy, and most of them are turned off in most of the major projects. Um, so CodeNARC, not all of the CodeNARC rules are applicable to every project. It's uh, like a huge collection of things. Some work for Grails, some work for uh, more Java projects. There's JUnits, there's Spock rules. Um, so I wouldn't expect anything in particular to have all of them turned on. Um, uh, yeah, and then I did actually run the entire thing and it reduced it by like 10,000 lines of code. Um, Um, I think they submitted it, or Andre submitted it as uh, on the mailing list before it officially gets uh, decided whether they're going to merge it or not. But that would be, I, I can see a lot of places where that would be really useful. The one I thought Nick's thing that doesn't follow the pattern matching uh, static fields or something like that. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of more applications in Grails uh, or applications for it. Yeah, so some things to turn off those uh, snarks. The question up there. some examples of things that CodeNARC changes or optimizes. So I have the, the oh, it's, I'm sorry. <sighs> okay. Yeah, so now you can, you can see my screen. That um, as, as part of the tests for CodeNARC, it actually against uh, the source code of, of CodeNARC itself. A kind of interesting message when you're uh, creating a new rule that uh, this run against itself test is failing. Uh, and it's probably because of the code that you just wrote. Um, yeah, so run, run code NARC against the entire project, runs it against uh, the source. And I'm trying to think of something that's very... Most of the formatting ones are pretty simple. Oh, this is, okay, line length rule. Um, if you add an extra uh, line, then I'll complain. If I, uh, and then if I try to run the tests, it should complain that I, that this happened. One of the other places, so when I did the, the switch rule, it
cases where we had six or seven like if statements in a row that got reduced down. Uh, that ended up being pretty nice. But of course, I press test on the entire thing. There are lots and lots of tests here. So the one of them did, did fail. And if we open this, uh, yeah, so we, it runs against, uh, the message is a little bit cryptic because it's actually running the number of violations. You get two violations of We look at the standard output from this. Should see that, yeah. So the the line length that Groovy file that I had modified now has a consecutive blank lines, and oh, getting blind a little bit by the light, uh, and it shows you exactly what line numbers. It, that's of course a really really simple example, uh, but there's there's lots of other ways that the code gets reduced down as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, I. Um. I yeah. So I took. Uh, and and I still don't understand all of the bytecode operations. Uh, and okay, for should have done the questions thing. So the question is, uh. It, looking looking at bytecode can be a bit overwhelming. How do I learn how to read it? Part of that comes from uh, reading reading books, reading uh, about uh, like the Java conversion, and even that's not a true representation because it's a uh, display that uses another program. Uh, uh, Java P on the command line, and so I took a bunch of different small Groovy scripts. And uh, in the the final project, there's only about five, but in my entire uh, repository, there's got a, almost. I knew that worked in Groovy, and uh, looked at the byte was. Um, was also confusing because that makes it even harder. Like, oh, it, this is specific to invoke dynamic. This is specific to the way that the static compiler works. Um, but yeah, so so trying some different things out um, and uh, yeah, old old fashioned textbooks. through until the end, <laughs> even if it was a little overwhelming. <laughs>